Today, we will be discussing the power of setting. Today's lecture will be slightly different than previous lectures, as there will be several exercises where we will pause the lecture and give you some time to write a response. The exercises will be around 10 minutes per exercise, and we will have several of them interspersed throughout the lecture. Please be prepared and have your computer uh, ready to immediately begin the exercise when instructed so that you have as much time as you need to properly complete the lecture activities. You may take one minute now to open your word processor or your writing software and prepare your document for the exercises. Don't forget to properly label your document so that it can easily be shared and identified later. Take one minute now. Welcome back. It may seem strange to discuss setting in a class about writing essays. Generally, when we discuss setting, we are discussing setting as a location for a short story, novel, or screenplay. Usually, we do not discuss setting when learning how to write argumentative or academic essays. For this lecture, I'm going to be describing how to integrate setting into your autobiographical, personal, and narrative essays. However, let us first distinguish several different kinds of settings used in writing. The first kind of setting would be the fictional setting. In the fictional setting, the writer describes a fictional location either based on a real location or an imagined location. This is the setting that most important uh, that is most important in fiction writing, such as short stories, novels, and screenplays. When writing in a fictional setting, Establishing the setting is one of the first tasks for a writer, sometimes even before any of the plot points are introduced. In many fictional stories, the setting is an actual character that grows and changes with the other characters as the plot moves forward. At the very least, however, the fictional setting must be robust and detailed sensual and sensory, and the fictional setting must feel as alive as any other character. The reader should be able to smell the grass in the park, to feel the pounding of the summer heat, to hear the ringing of bicycle bells as kids ride along the sloped paths, to see the sparkling water of the duck ponds and to sense the anticipation of the darkening skies rushing in from the east. Generally speaking, though, this kind of description is not necessary for nonfiction essays, especially argumentative or academic essays. There is a kind of nonfictional essay which greatly relies on setting in a similar way as fictional stories. Autobiographical or personal essays and narrative essays greatly depend on the use of setting to communicate a mood or feeling that the writer wants the reader to live inside during the reading of the essay. Even philosophical, political, sociological, environmental, geographical essays these also rely heavily on the use of setting to establish mood. As Woodward states, before he begins writing, the writer must consider his point of view, which we reviewed at length in a previous lecture. The dominant mood, the selection of details, and the order of the presentation of details. These four, as Woodward states, are the four principal problems when describing a place or setting. Number one, the point of view of the essay, or from what vantage point the story is taking place. Number two, the dominant mood, or 
the feeling that the writer sets up through the use of special details. Number three, the selection of those details, or in another way of thinking about it, uh, the details which are not specifically mentioned by design. And number four, the order of the details presented, which often present both a logical framework and a philosophical outlook that the writer espouses and wants the reader to also espouse. As I stated before, the use of setting is one of the most important parts of any autobiographical writing. Just like in fictional stories, the use of setting in autobiography or personal essays is a character. But unlike in fiction, where the setting is a background piece that sometimes changes because of the plot, in an autobiographical essay or personal essay, the setting will express, react, and evolve along with the writer as the writer continues a process of growth. When you are writing an autobiographical essay, you must carefully consider the settings in which your story will take place, as those settings will not only inform your reader of the dominant mood of each section of your story, but also establishes what Leon Sermelian calls a factual heir to implausible tales. According to Sermelian, if a story is not located, if the necessary concrete visible details of the setting, the when and where are missing, if there is no furniture at all, the story becomes unreal. For the first exercise of this lecture, I would like you to take a few minutes and sketch out the settings of your autobiography. What locations would you include in a story about yourself? These should be real locations, but these locations should also have power in your life. They should both be a vessel for communicating some big ideas you will argue for in your essay, but they will also be a setting for your growth and a character that grows and changes over the course of your story about yourself. You should always come up with more ideas than you know you will have an opportunity to discuss. So take a few minutes now and write a list of 10 settings you could use in an autobiographical essay, and then briefly describe each of those 10 settings in a few words, a few words each, to describe the power those settings have in your life. For example, if I wrote 10 settings for myself, and I took just a small portion of my life, say from the age of 10 through the age of 20, I would list the following locations. Number one, the school playground where children would have recess between classes. Number two, the McDonald's where I used to travel to every week to wait for a carpool. Number three, a cold, empty, and foggy schoolyard where my friend and I used to walk to on the weekends. Number four, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, where I visited when I was 12. Number five, the backyard of my house, where I used to make up adventure stories. Number six, a house of my classmate, where I used to stop after school as I walked home by myself, a house where many of my classmates would gather and play on his Nintendo. Number seven, the green lawn of my church, where I spent Sunday afternoons climbing trees with my best friend. Number eight, the garage, where for a brief moment of my life, I slept in a quiet loft on a mattress away from the rest of my family. Number nine, my first dormitory, 
where I met my new roommate and began to learn lessons about living with people other than my family. And number 10, my advisor's office, who had an open door policy and always invited students to come and engage in academic discussions with him on Thursday afternoons. Obviously, when I sit down to write my autobiographical essay, I wouldn't use all 10 of these. In fact, I might take just one from the list, my travels to Rome when I was 12, generate another nine based on that trip alone, and write about how that trip changed my life from the bottom up. Or I might take a few of them and come up with a few more events that happened during those three and compose a totally different personal essay. You have a wealth of experiences you can funnel into a story about your life. In fact, if you were to write about your life even this year, you could fill up a bookshelf of experiences that were curious and interesting. So for the next 10 minutes, I'd like you to practice this technique and scale your life to a set of different settings in your life. And then take a few words to describe those events, either simply or deeply. We will continue the lecture in 10 minutes. Good luck. How do you make these locations feel alive? Once you have sketched out some locations for the setting of your narrative essay, the next task you have is to figure out how to make that place feel alive. Yes, you experienced that location. It was real to you. But how do you communicate that reality to your reader? As Robin Hemley says in Turning Life into Fiction, it's your job as a writer to convince us that we're in the world you've created, not the reader's job to believe. And you convince the reader through the sensory details you choose to convey a place. Hemley says that to properly convey a place to a reader, you have to re-experience it. Take your time. Lift your grandmother's teapot off the mantle, you know, the teapot that played tea for two when you lifted it. Notice the aromas. What's your grandmother cooking? Take a peek outside. If it's a fair day, take a walk. Go through the neighborhood. Wave to your friends and acquaintances. It's been a long time. If you do this exercise, a flood of memories is bound to come back to you. You'll be surprised by how much you remember. Write down every detail of this place. When you write your story, many of these details will come in handy and help transport your reader to this place in the same way you were transported. Hemley gives an example later in her chapter of the author Nancy Kincaid trying to remember what it was like living in Tallahassee, Florida. The thing I most wanted to capture about the place was the heat. The heat in Tallahassee is above and beyond anything I've ever experienced anywhere else. Because of the heat, people wore very few clothes, especially boys. I remember boys never wore shirts. Nobody wore shoes. It was kind of a shorts culture. I wanted the jungle-like quality of it all to come across. There were lots of vines and palmetto leaves. When we were little and watched Tarzan movies, which were supposed to be the African jungle, it always looked like Tallahassee, like our backyard. Also, because I was writing about blacks and whites, I wanted to capture the sense of how in my mind, Tallahassee had a lot of the terrain that I supposed you would find if you went to Africa. The heat and the jungle, 
and the vegetation and the snakes climbing everywhere, wildlife was very real. Natalie Goldberg also writes about the use of original details in writing down the bones. Life is so rich, Goldberg writes. If you can write down the, the real details of the way things were and are, you hardly need anything else. Even if you transplant the beloved windows, slow rotating Reinhold sign, wise potato chip rack, and tall red stools from the Arrow Tavern that you drank in New York into a bar in a story in another state and time, the story will have authenticity and groundedness. Goldberg says that our lives are at once ordinary and mythical. We live and die, age beautifully or full of wrinkles. We wake in the morning, buy yellow cheese, and hope we have enough money to pay for it. At the same instant, we have these magnificent hearts that pump through all the sorrow and all winters we are alive on the earth. We are important, and our lives are important. Magnificent, really. And their details are worthy to be recorded. This is how writers must think. This is how we must sit down with pen in hand. We were here. We are human beings. This is how we lived. Let it be known. The earth passed before us. Our details are important. Otherwise, if they're not, we can drop a bomb and it doesn't matter. But how do you make this intimately personal? Even the simplest of places, your home, office, or bedroom, evoke extraordinary memories. When I look around my office here, I have memories surrounding me. I have a bottle of perfume that I bought in Parma, Italy. I can still remember the closeted closeness of the shop where I bought it, the cobblestones of the street, and the humidity of the clouds above. The map behind me, I purchased at a garage sale on a very hot Saturday some summers ago, during the scalding month of August. I have several cups filled with sharpened colored pencils that I collected from under beds, carpets, and behind bookshelves. And then I spent a whole evening sharpening all the pens and placing them on my desk. They were pencils my children used for several years, and over time lost them in small pockets of the dining room. And I felt I should gather them all together so that the children could easily find them. But what ended up happening is that they added an unexpected color to my room. Finally, I have a little stone paperweight next to my monitor, a verse from 2 Timothy 1.7, which states, For God has not given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. This object holds a great memory for me, because at the time, my family had become unmoored and stuck in the United States after the outbreak of the coronavirus. To make matters worse, my entire community had locked down. My city had an 8 p.m. curfew, meaning no one could be on the streets after 8 p.m. The cities had all shut down, everyone was home, and just waiting for the coronavirus to pass by, like waiting for a hurricane or a tornado. Looking at that verse every day gave me the strength to get up in the morning, to smile when I didn't feel like smiling, to hug my children when all I wanted to do was curl up into a ball and go to sleep. Setting is a powerful tool, but the details of your setting are what bring it alive. For myself, my office 
holds great meaning to my life because of how I've grown alongside it over the years. For you, you may find great meaning in your childhood bedroom or along a path you walk every day or the dinner table where you ate with your parents every evening after they came home from a long day at work. You might have a core memory from going out with your friends at night to a market and eating kebabs or throwing stones along a creek. Your life is your own, and only you know what places have power in your life. To communicate the power hidden in your life, though, you'll need to do some investigating and find those places of power and unearth those details. For the second exercise of this lecture, I'd like you to take one of those 10 places you picked and write down another list. This second list will be details about that setting. Sensory details, such as what it looked like, what it smelled like, how it felt, what you heard, perhaps even the tastes you experienced at that place. You can include other details like the people who were there, what they were like, who they were to you, how they added color or changed the feeling of the place. For example, a kitchen with a grandmother and a kitchen without a grandmother feel like two totally different places. Then take a mental tour of that location. Where are the stories there? Pay attention to sight and sound and sniff out the stories. As Goldberg explains in Writing Down the Bones, learn to write about the ordinary. Give homage to old coffee cups, sparrows, city buses, thin ham sandwiches. Make a list of everything ordinary you can think of. Keep adding to it. Promise yourself, before you leave the earth, to mention everything on your list at least once. How you do this exactly is up to you. Uh, for this exercise, you can sketch out some notes, write lists of details, draw a mind map where you connect details with other details through visual lines and circles, or just brainstorm and write as much as you can within a short period of time, say, one or two minutes about a particular place and setting. Then try again and dive deeper and write about more details using a magnifying glass to see things you didn't see before. And each time you move closer with a more careful eye, you will see things you didn't see before. Take 10 minutes to immerse yourself in one of your settings. Once you have the setting and the details, how do you then paint this image into reality? Remember, when you are writing a personal story, autobiographical sketch or narrative essay, Having the setting and details is one thing, but writing a convincing portrait of that setting is entirely another thing. While some teachers consider good versus bad writing as a talent or ability, I consider this as a discipline or trade. Just as some people can sing naturally with perfect pitch, even singers without the ability to sing, if they train themselves to hear the sound of their own voice and train themselves how to sing thirds, fourths, sixths, or even octave skips, they can learn how to sight read and sing a cappella just as powerfully as a person who is born with intrinsic ability. Just because a person can copy whatever they see and draw anything from a young age, 
doesn't mean that someone else cannot learn uh, how learn what forms compose an image, how to imitate those forms, and how to manipulate a pencil or brush to bring those forms into reality. Also, just because a person can naturally use language to describe something in almost perfect detail doesn't mean another person cannot learn how to creatively apply those words to describe deeper meanings by learning the meanings of words, studying structures of language used in the past, and practicing through trial and error to find the best combination of word and phrase to bring out inner meaning. After all, if AI can learn to write by just applying previous models, then anyone can learn to write. Here is a prompt I used with an AI tool. Write a 50-word passage in the style of Cormac McCarthy about a student watching a Zoom lecture about learning how to write, struggling to understand the native English because the student primarily speaks Chinese and only uses English as a second language. The student is taking the class from China, is sitting at a computer in the dormitory, and is trying to learn how to write narrative nonfiction through Zoom. Then, here is the result of the AI tool. In the cramped solitude of a dormitory in China, a student sat before a flickering screen, his gaze fixed upon a distant world. The luminous glow gave birth to a symphony of English words, a foreign melody that echoed through his mind. Through the digital realm of Zoom, he sought to unravel the enigmatic art of narrative nonfiction a journey through the vast landscapes of words. But as the professor's voice danced with elegant cadence, the student's eyes grew heavy with confusion, for English remained a distant tongue, conquered but still elusive. In his humble struggle, he marveled at the daunting beauty of language, and the lessons taunted his eager mind, teasing him with tantalizing knowledge just beyond his grasp. Yet, amidst the frustration, a flicker of determination ignited within him, fueling to resolve to tame this linguistic beast. From the depths of his dormitory, he vowed to chart the treacherous seas of storytelling, letting the dance of words carry him forward undeterred by the barriers that language presented. And so, in the midst of a world engulfed by distance and digital connection, this student knelt at the altar of learning, his quest for narrative nonfiction set ablaze by these virtual encounters, each Zoom lecture carrying him closer to his literary destiny. Now, let's first notice a number of things in this example. Firstly, as in all results from AI, the logic of the sentences is broken. Just like in AI art, ideas crash into each other in alarming ways, and the baseline meaning of the passage is not communicated very well. Many of the phrases are just outright ridiculous such as the student knelt at the altar of learning, which is both very strange and doesn't connect with anything else in the passage. Secondly, the results from the AI make several assumptions that were not in the original text, such as having more, having more than one Zoom session, whether the student is trying to learn narrative nonfiction or English or both, which isn't clear, and the, the desire by the student in having a literary destiny, 
which was never implied nor stated in the original prompt. The result is a hodgepodge of ridiculous, over-the-top language that doesn't in any way mimic the style of Cormac McCarthy at all. That being said, if you read this out of the blue, you would be impressed. So the fact that a computer with just an algorithm could compose an English passage with a limited set of input commands, the lack of human experience, the lack of human emotion, and zero talent, besides just copying forms, if that could write like this, that should be inspirational to you, that if you put in the time, you will not only match what this stupid AI could produce, but also surpass it a thousand times. So, now that you hopefully have some confidence you personally can do this, let's come back to the topic and explore how you can describe your setting into reality. Let's go back to what Woodward stated about setting. Number one, point of view. Number two, dominant mood. Number three, selection of details. And number four, presentation of details. Now, listen to this passage from Elizabeth George's For the Sake of Elena, and try to identify these four principles in her short introduction to London. The fog lay heavily on the city the next morning, a gray blanket of mist that rose like a gas from the surrounding fens and billowed into the air in amorphous clouds that shrouded trees, buildings, roadways, and open land, changing everything from common and recognizable substance into mere shape. Cars, lorries, buses, and taxis inched their way along the damp pavements of the city streets. Bicyclists slowly swayed through the gloom. <clears throat> Pedestrians huddled into heavy coats and dodged the constant spattering of the drops of condensation that fell from roof lines, window ledges, and trees. The two days of wind and sunshine might never have existed. Fog had returned like a pestilence in the night. This was Cambridge weather with a vengeance. Not only is this a thousand times better than the AI-generated description, Woodward's four principles are clearly illustrated. The reader is immersed within the fog as point of view. The dominant mood is dismal and gloomy. The details selected are what is immediately visible through the fog such as cars, buses, and bicycles. And there is a relationship between the details and the settings that the author carefully layers like a cake to show how the fog has invaded even the common and the ordinary. Now, this passage isn't exceptionally great. Elizabeth George is an American mystery writer she has published 30 novels that basically use a similar structure for each story. And she wrote a couple books about writing, including Write Away, which is the book I am using for this class, to describe her approach to writing. She won an award for her first novel, and she has a master's degree in psychology from a relatively small California public university. She is a good example of a professional writer who has learned some very basic skills that she has put to use in her writing, which you can also use in your own writing. Like myself, George also believes strongly that writing can be taught, that anyone can learn how to write, and that the only way to learn how to write well is to become familiar with the craft of writing. George uses another example from the author Martin Cruz Smith when he is describing a dismal English town called Wigan. Again, 
Listen for those four principles in this long passage. <clears throat> the dark sky turned darker, not with clouds, but with a more pungent ingredient. From the window, Blair saw what could have been the towering effluent plume of a volcano, except that there was no erupting volcanic cone, no mountain of any size, in fact, between the Pennines to the east and the sea to the west, nothing but swale and hill above the long tilt of underground carboniferous deposits. The smoke rose not from a single point, but as a dark veil across the northern horizon, as if all the land thereafter was on fire. Only closer could a traveler tell that the horizon was an unbroken line of chimneys. Chimneys congregated around cotton mills, glassworks, iron foundries, chemical works, dye works, brick works. But the most monumental chimneys were at the coal pits, as if the earth itself had been turned into one great factory. When Blake wrote of dark satanic mills, he meant chimneys. The hour was almost dusk, but this darkness was premature. Even Earnshaw stared through the window with some awe. When enough chimneys had passed one by one, the sky turned the ashen gray of an eclipse. On either side, private tracks connected pits to the canal ahead. Between the pall and the lines of steel lay Wigan, at first sight looking more like smoldering ruins rather than a town. Coal has worked into the town itself, creating coat tips that were black hills of slag. On some, coal gas escaped as little flames that darted between peak to peak like blue imps. The train slowed along the pit as a cage load of miners reached the surface. Coated in coal dust, the men were almost invisible, except for the safety lamps in their hands. The train slid past a tower topped by a headgear that, even in the subdued light, Blair saw was painted red. On the other side, figures crossed single file across the slag, taking a shortcut home. Blair caught them in profile. They wore pants and coal dust, too, but they were women. The track bridged the canal over barges heaped with coal, then traveled by a gas works and a rank of cotton mills, their high windows bright, and the chimneys that drove their spinning machines spewing as much smoke as castles sacked and set ablaze. The locomotive slowed with its own blasts of steam. Tracks split off to goods sheds and yards. In the middle, like an island, was a platform with iron columns and hanging lamps. The train approached at a creep, gave a last convulsive shake, and stopped. This is almost a perfect example of how to write setting as a character. Now, for the final exercise, as you are walking to class, sitting in the cafeteria, studying in a classroom, resting in your dormitory, participating in a club, or exercising around campus, for example. Describe the setting as a character in the story of your life. Present the setting as a living and breathing organism that is participating in your growth as a person. And use that setting as you use that setting to describe your inner mind, your emotions, your struggles, as you strive to understand who you are becoming as a person. You should write one or two paragraphs or eight to 10 full sentences. Obviously, 
I don't expect you to write as well as Cormac McCarthy, Elizabeth George, or Martin Cruz Smith. But don't be afraid to let the crazy voice inside of you outside for a minute or two. Really take that setting and let it become a character in your mind. Give it a shape. Give it form. Give it some personality. I will give you around 10 minutes to work on this right now. And then after the lecture is over, you can continue to work on it and sharpen uh, your work as you want. The last point I want to make in this lecture is the importance of your audience. We spoke in a previous lecture about the importance of point of view, not only where your writing takes place, but also where your audience is. Even in an argumentative or academic essay, you must be keenly aware of where your audience is of what kind of information your audience can understand and the potential of your audience to properly interpret your writing. For example, I am assuming that many of you may need to replay portions of this lecture at a later time due to how complex some of the ideas presented in these passages may be. And that through careful study, you will discover a new set of ideas. However, if you are writing for writing an essay for a newspaper, magazine, or online periodical, your readers will not have the desire or requirement to study what you are writing. In fact, they may have the opposite, a lack of patience and no incentive to reread anything they do not immediately understand. So, there are a few key principles to keep in mind. Number one, know your audience. Who are they? Where are they? And what do they expect from your writing? Number two, establish a baseline setting that your audience can clearly understand. For example, if you are writing about a social problem and your audience is from your local neighborhood or country, don't write the essay from the perspective of someone from another country or neighborhood. This is partially why it's so important for you to clearly think about your setting through careful pre-writing and modeling. Number three, even argumentative and academic essays require a setting, although these settings are not as explicit as a setting from an autobiographical sketch, personal, or narrative essay. I will discuss in detail in a later lecture about this form of setting when we learn about how to properly compose argument in essays. Always remember that no matter your level of language, you have the ability to eclipse the best writing in the world. Some of the best writers have written in English as a second language or even a third language. In the end, it comes down to discipline, craft, and practice.